This is a story about featuring the things we thought we needed to fix. The pandemic focused all of us on the need to fix our supply chains. But what if we could use technology not just to fix our supply chains, but to rethink them altogether? Could we use them to transform our markets, our workforce, and our economy itself? Stopping the spread of the deadly coronavirus has meant stopping the spread of more than just germs. Goods, parts, and people have been halted in place. I think the pandemic sort of brought logistics to the limelight from this like tucked in the corner industry to really, really be in the forefront of all of us, of consumers and society. And when supply chains stop, economy stop. Going back to the COVID days in 2020, we started buying online like we had never seen before. And so what happened then with all of that cargo rushing in, it was like taking 10 lanes of LA freeway traffic and squeezing them into five. But what if we could use technology not just to fix supply chains, but to rethink them altogether? Could we use them to transform our markets, our workforce, and our economy itself? Logistics is the largest cost for the manufacturing and retail economy. And if you drive that cost down, like anything else we have seen in the history of economy, you unleash the next epoch of economical activity. Lior Ron recently became COO of autonomous trucking company Wabi after co-founding Uber Freight back in 2017. Their cost of goods uh, moved is sometimes 30, 40 percent of their cost of operation. It's a prohibitor for them to scale and to be bigger. If you take that cost down, you essentially democratize access to logistics. You encourage more economical activity if you reduce the friction, in the end of the day, it's friction in the system. If you reduce the friction in the system on manufacturing, on distribution, on moving those goods around, you just unlock a bunch of new economical opportunity. You unlock manufacturing strength. You unlock new predictability back to COVID. You unlock resiliency. And that set the stage for a rapid economical activity. The stakes are enormous but how to get from here to there. Ron says the answer lies, in part, in that artificial intelligence everyone's talking about. I think AI allows you, the way I think about it, really like three levels of optimization and uh, supporting function. Uh, one is logistics is a highly fragmented, highly manual ecosystem. You have hundreds of thousands of operators, acting as glue, overcoming all those information challenges, doing a lot of repeated manual tasks, which is really sort of like taxing the system from a cost perspective and from an efficiency perspective, and more importantly, just from a time perspective. The second level is optimization. Can we now actually start looking at the supply chain holistically and start driving smarter decisions? Can we optimize those empty miles? Why does it need to be 40% empty miles if we know everything and we could connect everything together and we can actually start uh, smartly designing the uh, network so you can actually minimize those empty miles? And the last level is using AI to truly drive better decision-making. Let's have a chat GPT for my supply chain. And the most important one is unleashing AI to the physical world with physical AI and self-driving, which I think is really sort of the deepest disruption and the most profound change that we'll see with AI in supply chain in the next decade. Part of what Ron envisions for the future is happening right now in the port of Los Angeles. There's so much here, and I think we're just scratching the surface. Gene Soroka is the executive director of the Port of Los Angeles, the busiest container port in the United States. One of the areas that we stepped into right away was digitalization of all the port's information. How many ships are coming in, containers, what trucks and trains need to be planned? How do we get our great skilled labor at the right place, anticipating the cargo that was coming in? So we worked with the Wabtec company to develop the first information sharing system for a port here in the United States. We call it the Port Optimizer. We can now see cargo 40 days before the ship arrives into Los Angeles, giving us ample time to plan all those things. The skilled labor, 
the land, the machinery, and just that intuitiveness about how we're gonna handle things if something doesn't go to schedule, and normally that's the case. There's always an adjustment that has to be made in the supply chain. So now we can see things every morning, a dashboard of information about the velocity, the vital statistics of the port, and I can tell you after about 90 seconds of a review how we're doing and what we need to do next. That digitalization started to introduce prescriptive and predictive analytics. Then we start to get into really, really in interesting engineering work. We're gonna have a project here on the Vincent Thomas Bridge to resurface it. So we're using geospatial mapping and great companies like Esri and the Jet Propulsion Lab to help us now simulate traffic patterns ahead of time and in real time allow drivers to move around with much more knowledge than they had before. It's gonna help this trucking community out in a tremendous way. What Soroka is pursuing within the Port of Los Angeles, Roger Penske is doing on roads coast to coast and even around the world. We do 500,000 vehicles. We're in four continents and nine countries, and we have our truck leasing, rental, and logistics, and we have 44,000 people. So it's a real enterprise from artificial intelligence, what we're using in the truck leasing business, we're taking, downloading 200,000 vehicles a night with operating data. When I look at the amount that we capture on an annual basis, it's a billion units of data. And we run 5 million, 600 million miles with our trucks. And when you take that, we need somewhere to aggregate it. So we're starting to use what we call Catalyst AI. It's a AI product where we look at the data, we diagnose the data, we go to our customers, and we use this as a connection. The Penske company's use of AI is not limited to monitoring its massive fleet. It also uses it in the maintenance required to keep that fleet on the road. We then become to build a process where we have predictive maintenance. So AI is telling us this truck should come into our shop. You might have the same truck, but a different duty cycle. So when that truck comes in our shop, what happens is the mechanic goes uh, to the computer, he, he scans the barcode or the VIN number on the truck, he puts on a headset with a mic and what we call guided repair. And that guided repair takes him through the whole maintenance process on the trucks. And then that data, because it's live, goes into our SOS center, which is our call center for breakdown. This whole avenue, downloading, the data, taking it, making it real, then we take it and for the customer, we'll go back to you as, as a fleet and we'll take and give you your data live and how we compare location to location you have. And we can look at that and then determine what are the things that we have to do, take action. We have 15,000 customers and many of them don't have the opportunity to have this kind of data. So it's sticky, it's important, and it's taking all the technology that we can get. Whenever we begin to talk about automation and AI, people raise questions about jobs. What's the effect on jobs? Are you going to eliminate a lot of jobs in supply chains? It's a hard job. And many folks, many young folks do not want to take on this job, being 300 days on the road, not being able to raise a family, not being able to have predictable access to uh, sleep and food. I think for the foreseeable future, as you start rolling self-driving gradually, you augment those jobs, you fulfill the empty spots in the demand uh, for those jobs. You don't replace those jobs. There's going to be plenty of time for the existing population to retire over the next few decades as the truck replacement cycle, again, it's like four million trucks in the United States, it's gonna take a while until self-driving will actually sort of make an economical dent to the driving population. So I see that as a gradual job, transition on self-driving. I think if you look at knowledge workers, I think we'll see a faster transition because the digital AI will, is even more prevalent and will scale potentially even faster, I think there it's about an opportunity to up-level. So at Uber Freight, we've automated a bunch of those manual repetitive tasks, but then those folks have been up-leveled and they're now more sort of an orchestrators of an orchestra. They are the brain behind actually orchestrating all those agents because those AI agents can now do this job and that job and that job, and I'm sort of more the integrator. There is no replacement for the human connectivity, so I can spend my time focusing on customer needs. 
I think in the idea that people think that jobs will disappear, that it'll be just talking to AI. Um, I think it's overhyped. Chris Kaplis is the executive director of MIT's Center for Logistics and Transportation. I think there's a lot of overhype in that it can truly take over a human's full job, when in fact, jobs are tasks, and it'll take over some tasks. And so then some, there are certain tasks that each one of us in our jobs do that cannot be done by AI, to include the person filming us right now. It's more the mundane things that uh, you know, get automated, and then the things that can help enhance what a human does. I think there's a continuum on how you automate things. We've been automating stuff forever, uh, right? And, but there's a line of uh, this is mundane, and over here I still need a human. That line keeps moving as AI gets smarter. I don't think it'll go all the way. Artificial intelligence may well transform our supply chains, but to get there, it's not enough to have AI alone. It has to be linked to autonomy. What is AI without autonomous vehicles? What are autonomous vehicles without AI? I fundamentally see the next decade really about building the autonomous infrastructure of the industry, and I view self-driving as the most profound help in driving efficiency and safety into supply chain. The whole digital infrastructure in the end of the day can drive 10, 15 percent optimization of the network. When you start actually moving assets in a self-driving way, when you can move an asset from six hours a day of being utilized with a human driver to 20 hours, 24 hours, when you can drive safety into our roads with thousands of unnecessary deaths and half a million related incidents in the U.S. every year on trucks, you can make a profound change and a profound um, help to the industry. This is the time. I think it's a confluence of many things really coming together to make the next year, not even five years, the next year transformative from self-driving in the industry. Like this is game time. This is real now, it's happening.